Hello there, I'm Leslie Atherton and this is my short story, Hands in Luck. Hans was a man for whom the power of positive thinking was unnecessary. He relied entirely upon that great and much envied quality that only a few fortunate souls are born with, that they always happen to be in the right place at the right time. Hans, in fact, was the kind of man who, if he fell off a horse, would land in a pile of goose down, find a newly plucked goose within that down and take it home for his evening meal. He was the kind of man who, while disembowelling and preparing the bird for a delicious roast goose meal, would discover that said goose had just eaten a bag of metal pieces which, when cleaned and polished, were discovered to be priceless coinage of great antiquity. You think I joke? Nobody could be that lucky, you say. Well, I'm sorry to say that you're wrong. It's all true, every word, and happened to Lucky Hans not very long ago. And there's more. Hans decided to sell a few of the coins at his local antique dealer, and with some of the proceeds purchased a barrel organ, which he immediately took into the village square to play for the entertainment of dancing villagers. This wasn't a community service or a busking escapade. Hans was simply having fun with friends. How great and wonderful a man Hans was. Of course, Lucky Hans, being lucky, was seen by the mayor of the village and was immediately offered a specially created job as a professional barrel organ player. Said mayor had been searching for ways of increasing tourism and Lucky Hans and his barrel organ had come along at just the right time. Lucky mayor? Not quite. Hans held up his hands and refused. His fun with the barrel organ had led him to make the decision that he was going to become a travelling musician, see the world and make children smile. And so that's what Lucky Hans did. He packed up the remainder of his priceless bag of coins, heaved his barrel organ onto a wheelbarrow, covered it with tarpaulin and set off on his travels. Hans met many people and was involved in a great many odd barrel organ adventures, but his cousin Stefan has asked me to tell you about just one. It was the most important one, the day Hans met Esmeralda. Hans had for a little while been playing his barrel organ in the city centre. Admittedly, this was against the advice of his cousin Stefan, who had lived there for many years. Stefan said, No, 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 you must not play in Dangerfield Gardens. They aren't gardens, and they are very dangerous. That's how they got their name. He was a wise man who worked with disadvantaged children and drug users in the city centre, so he knew what he was talking about. The gardens weren't a suitable location for a barrel organ, under any circumstances. But even more than that, they weren't a suitable location for hands. Stefan's cousin was one of those round-faced, ruddy-cheeked chaps who fit him well on an alp or while muck-spreading, but whose clothes and fresh-grown optimism were very much out of place in an urban garden or a busy, style-obsessed city centre. Stefan's advice hadn't been heeded. And now Stefan didn't know what to do for the best. Hans was insistent, yet Stefan wanted to protect his cousin's simple soul. It was proving difficult, because all Hans wanted to do was to play the barrel organ in the city, in Dangerfield Gardens. He'd already played in all the local villages, and this move to the metropolis was intended as a new way of life for him. Fortunately, Stefan had an idea. He encouraged Hans to visit a friend for the first few days of winter, and to return when the German Christmas markets were in town. Dangerfield Gardens changed into a winter wonderland then, and Hans would slot in beautifully. Stefan even purchased his beloved cousin a licence, so he was good to go. Yes, he was still in Dangerfield Gardens, but he was now surrounded by Gluevine and hot dog stores and people selling funny unwearable hats and beautiful though pointless gift items. It was safe, and Hans had found his heaven. He played the barrel organ and smiled constantly. His personality was so endearing that even the previously cynical would listen to him with respect. The playing of a barrel organ is largely a mechanised affair, so nobody listened open-mouthed at Hans's great musicality, but they did pass by and smile, often walking in time with the music, each corny little note granting them great pleasure. That was, all except one group, a group of actors, They were tetchy from time on the road and positioned themselves close to the barrel organ, though Hans had been there first. 
They competed with him volume-wise, the punters, and every day tried to make their show a little more risque, interesting, intellectual and silly. You know what I mean. They were trying for universal appeal and they got it. The people wandering around those Christmas markets, markets with their brightly coloured cabins and the leather goods, scented candles and lots of gingerbread, were fickle souls. Their legs took them where the excitement was. And in this market, this year, the actor troupe, called Simon Pyman, were where it was at. It was no longer bliss for hands. Heaven had hastened away. Even the tiny children and their grateful parents didn't stop for long in front of Hans's barrel organ once the actors muscled in. Even the middle-aged couples who would normally dance a few seconds of the polka in front of him with silly joy on their faces, even they were transfixed by Simon Pyman and walked by Hans without a glance. Perhaps his time had come to leave the city. Perhaps his luck had run out after all. He was pondering on that, miserable and dejected, when he wandered around a corner of the market he'd not remembered passing before. It was unusual that he didn't recognise it, as it lay on the most direct route to the library, and he loved to read, especially soaking up old songbooks and researching crowd control. Anyway, the stall was undoubtedly there, bold and bright, and the makeshift sign on its frontage read Markham's Marionettes. There were puppets everywhere. Hans was transfixed, hailing as he did from a renowned puppet-making area. He understood the skill involved and the magic too. The difference between a puppet you could believe in and a well-crafted doll on strings was often indiscernible, but he understood the basics. It was about far more than wood and hooks and paint and tiny colourful clothing. It was about spirit, capturing the spirit, the essence of the puppet, capturing that and making the puppet live. Good day, said Hans to the stallholder. I'm just admiring your puppets. I know a little about their construction as I was born in one of the world's most prolific puppet-making villages, but I've never seen puppets quite like these before. And you won't again, replied the stallholder, with a mysterious smile. These puppets are unique, more special than you could ever know. Oh yes, I can see that. Just look at this one here, all the paintwork and the intricacy of its joints. Oh my, it's so real. It is that, replied the stallholder. You're the barrel organ man, aren't you? I've been hoping you'd visit. Here. With those words, the stallholder pulled out a box from behind his small cabin's counter. The box was wooden, handmade, and engraved with many patterns and lines in a complex design, intended to offer an optical illusion to the viewer. Gosh, the box is beautiful, said Hans. That's not the half of it, said the stallholder. Here. And with that, he opened the lid to the box and delicately removed the most exquisite puppet that Hans could ever have imagined. The puppet was in female form, with her long, curled, chestnut brown hair, looking as if it had just been trimmed and elegantly styled, just like Jane Russell's in The Outlaw. Her face, though carved in wood, had more expression than any puppet he'd seen before, and her hand-painted features gave her the appearance, not of a painted doll, but of a living, breathing, sensual woman. Initially, Hans couldn't take his eyes off her face. When he chose to look further at the doll's figure and clothing, Hans was equally enraptured. This marionette or puppet, how it pained him to think of her in that way, was formed down to the last detail as a human adult female, and a heavenly one at that. The only things giving her away as a puppet were the way her joints were made of interlocked hooks, and her height being only a couple of feet. Her own feet were bare. Why does she wear no shoes? Hans asked, part expecting the storeholder to remove them from the box and lace them onto her small wooden feet. Instead, he pulled out the pair of lace-up leather boots and shook his head. She doesn't like to wear them. She's a bit of a free spirit. She's dressed as a character in a traditional European fairy tale, the laced bodice, the white underblouse, the full skirt, but she's not your typical peasant, as I'm sure you can tell, Hans. It never even struck Hans to wonder how the stallholder knew his name. It was as natural as was the presence of the puppet stall. He listened. Her skirt has been embroidered in a traditional Romany style. Her white underblouse combines the elements of Cornish smock and Indian curta. Her bodice takes influence from all over the world. See this design and this design? 
Her underskirt, the stall holder paused to lift her skirt slightly and show hands, is made of pure silk. There are three layers, each embroidered with silk threads, and there's a little magic in each one. She's wonderful, gushed Hans. He wasn't savvy enough to understand that the more an item appealed to a potential customer, the more the seller might ask for it. He was speaking purely in aesthetic terms of wonderment and joy. She was wonderful, the most wonderful thing he'd ever seen. Even his barrel organ paled in comparison. Now there was a thought. Perhaps if he bought her, he might be able to make her dance. Plenty of organ owners did that. Hans had always enjoyed the dancing that came with the working of a barrel organ, but having a puppet dancer didn't mean he could never dance again himself. It was just another dimension, added fun if you like. He was tempted, but knew he would never be able to afford this particular young lady. How much would she cost? he asked. How much? replied the stall holder. She is priceless. She is the most valuable puppet I have ever held, and she is not for sale. How much? Hans asked again. She is not for sale. How much? he asked a third time. Please? Let's see what we can do. And so later... Hans walked back to his barrel organ with his purse considerably lighter, much of the ancient coinage gone, but he had her. Oddly, the box was heavy, and was becoming heavier each step he walked, and Hans was relieved to reach the barrel organ. The neighbouring actors were loud, hammy and overly dramatic, and their audience laughed stupidly, but Hans didn't care. He had her. He knew her name already. He'd known it from the moment he saw her. He called her Esmeralda. Esmeralda. He could die happy from simply holding the exquisite beauty. He must learn to make her move and perform. That, after all, was the main point of a puppet. Even one as beautiful and unique as Esmeralda undoubtedly was. So, sitting at the rear of the silent barrel organ, he pulled her gently from her box and stared. His fingers moved into the control wood and he stood upright, allowing her verticality for the first time. She was even more wonderful when standing up fully. He would have to stand on a platform to perform easily with her. He would build one tomorrow. Hansi's fingers, often clumsy when faced with intricacy in multiple unpracticed movements, were untypically nimble now. It didn't take long before his Esmeralda was walking, dancing, smiling, talking and holding him down. "'What are you doing, Esmeralda?' Hans asked. "'I am your lady,' she replied. We are special, you and me. I will make you happy. I will be the one for you. Come, let us dance together. Her face was radiant and loving, and there was something else too. But Hans didn't notice. He saw only her swirling, hand-embroidered petticoats and her ringleted hair. They danced and she laughed. He decided to give the barrel organ to Stefan, who had always been admiring of it, and to move on to some other town, just man and puppet. Dance with me again, Hans, demanded Esmeralda, as they moved together to exhausting heights of activity. She laughed and smiled, and there was something else, too. But Hans didn't notice, and none of this seemed strange to him, as it might to you and me, for after all, he was already under her spell. He had been bewitched from the moment he turned the corner and spied the puppet stall. A puppet stall that hadn't been there the moment before he looked, and wasn't there as soon as he turned his back.